Good morning, Grapefruit friends. Pastor Dan is off this morning and he's asked me to bring the message this morning. So what I want to do first is I want to take you back to the, the biblical calendar. And as you can see, we're just at the end of ordinary time. Uh, or not so ordinary, if, if I can say that. For most of us at this time, it's probably not uh, so ordinary. And, but we must remember that it's not just for us that it's not so ordinary. But this not so ordinary time is really spread over the whole world. And so I just want to, um, us to realize that the times that we're living in, though they may not be ordinary, God is still with us. And God is faithful. This morning I want to take us back a, a number of weeks to one of Pastor Dan's messages. Uh, when Moses was conversing with God about knowing his ways and understanding him in a more complete way. So I'll put uh, Exodus 33, 12 to 16, and let's read it. One day Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me, take these people to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You've told me I know you by name and I look favorably on you. If it's true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so that I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember that this nation is your very own people. The Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and your people, if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on earth. So Moses is conversing with God and saying, whom, whom will you send me? And God says to him, I will personally go with you, and I will give you rest. When we were listening to this passage a number of weeks back, I couldn't help thinking of someone else in the New Testament who said words that were very similar to the words that were spoken to Moses 1,500 years before he spoke them. So let's turn this morning, for my text is from John chapter 14, verses 15 to 27. And Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but the other disciple with that name said to him, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us and not to the world at large? And Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I'm telling you is from the Father who sent me. I am telling you these things while I am still with you. But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is, the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything I have told you. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. 
And the peace I give, give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Jesus' earthly ministry was coming to a close. And he was having his last conversations with his disciples. He gathered them together to answer the questions, to tell them of his departure, to encourage them to keep on believing. He promised them that if they would love him and they would obey him, they would never be alone. He promised he would not abandon them, that he would come to them, and that though the world would not see him or recognize him, they would see him. He said, I'm leaving you, but don't be troubled or afraid. I'm coming back. And can we imagine this morning where the, what the disciples thought at that moment? Really? You're leaving, but you're coming back? I don't think the disciples could even grasp for a moment the words from the one they had followed, from the one they ate with, the one they slept with, the one that they, they walked with and watched his miracles, the one that was their king, their Messiah, their deliverer, the one that would set them free from their oppression. If we look back in the previous chapter, in chapter 13, the, these are some of the questions that came to the Lord Jesus on that night. Peter said, Lord, where are you going? And then he said, why can't I come? And then in John, the 14th chapter, he said, Thomas said this, he says, he says, we have no idea where you are going. And Philip also said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. And I think that Jesus had just explained to them that he would lead them, that he would teach them, that he would show himself to us. And here they are asking, I want to go. Where are you going? I'm going to lead you, Jesus said. I think we can safely say this morning that the disciples of Jesus were not really on the same page as their master. A thought Here's a thought for us to consider when thinking of Christ's purpose for coming to earth. Yes, to pay the ultimate price on the cross for mankind's sin. Yes, to open the way to eternal life for all. But also, by his mercy and grace and loving kindness, to allow them that love him and them that obey him to be on the same page. That we might come to know his ways. That we might come to understand him in a more complete way. Remember Moses? This was his request. And God answered him favorably. Favorably. He asked for God's presence to go with him. And he asked for God to show him his glory. And he asked to know God in a more complete and personal way. Same page. Yes, Moses was on the same page with God Almighty. As much as could be as a human being. But the people that he was leading were not on that page most of the time. They just wanted Moses to be their deliverer. They just wanted Moses to, to, talk, to talk to God and then tell them what to do. Can we see the similarities in Jesus' time with his disciples? This was the long-awaited one to come to bring justice and peace to the Jewish nation. They liked what was happening. Why should it change? But they didn't understand Jesus' purpose for dying and for leaving them. When he told them, he was preparing them, I'm going to go, I'm going I'm to die, and I'm going to leave you. He told them this so that they would understand, but at this time, they did not understand that. And when the crisis began with, with Jesus being arrested, what happened to the disciples? They ran. 
Same page. Let's look back at our passage today. Jesus is promising that if they loved him and obeyed him, he would ask the Father and he would give them a helper. He would give them an advocate, one who would stand beside them, one who would comfort them, one who would encourage them, one who would never leave them, one who would be in them. And he said the world could not receive him. The world could not recognize him. But they who were right there with Jesus would know him because he was with them presently. And he said, later, I will be in you. Ooh. In. That's the key point. In. So this must have really sent the disciples reeling. But Jesus knew that they, they didn't understand. And he also knew that after he was gone, and after he sent that comforter and that spirit to come to them, they would begin to understand and so this morning I want to look at three things that Jesus talked about in this passage that the Holy Spirit would do in them. He told them in verse 26 that when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything. Now, depending on which translation you're reading, I'm reading from the New Living Translation this morning, and, and uh, some of the translations do not have, he will teach you in that, in that particular spot. You'd have to look over into John 16, 13 to find that. He says, I will guide you into all the truth. But he says, he will teach you everything, and he will remind you of everything I have told you. And verse 17 says, he would lead us into all the truth. He would lead us. Remember what Peter said? Where are you going? Can I come? And, 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 and Thomas, show us the Father. Show us the Father. And verse 21 says it clearly. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them and I will love them and reveal myself to them, or I will show myself to them. Three things. He will teach you everything and remind you of the things I've said. He would lead you into the truth, and he would reveal himself to each of them. In verse 22, in Judas, not Iscariot, he says, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself to us only and not to the world at large. And Jesus replied and said, All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. So this disciple's question kind of changes the focus. It, it broadens the picture for us. Because it says, it's not just about us, disciples. It's not just about the Jewish nation. It's something much more. And as we look at the life of the, the disciples after the day of Pentecost, when the people in Jerusalem saw and heard what was going on, and they, they asked this question, what does it mean? When the Holy Spirit had come upon his disciples, they didn't need much much encouragement. Peter just, just stood up and he began to proclaim the message. Because the one who said, I will, I will encourage you, the one who gives courage was now in him to help him. He just stood and began to preach Jesus. Thousands of converts. And we like this part because there's thousands of converts. And, and that is part of the purpose of Almighty God. It's part of it. But what was happening on the ground after these days? 
The believers, the ones who had, who had come to faith in Jesus Christ, the ones whose lives had been transformed and changed, the ones who had, had said, yes, I will accept this one. I will believe in that one Jesus who was crucified. And I will walk and trust him. What was happening in their lives? They began loving their neighbors. They began helping those in need. They began devoting themselves to learning, to the apostles' teaching. They began to come together as a body. They began to share with each other in food and sharing with other with the, with the greatness of God in their lives and prayer. And as God was revealing himself, they were being led into the truth. God was working in their lives and just leading them to do the things in their natural lives that are so important to the, to the things of God. It was a bigger, bigger plan than the disciples would have ever imagined on the night they spent with Jesus before his crucifixion. Was it about getting his people on the same page? Was it about getting them to know his ways and to understand him more completely? Yes. And yes again. But God's plan in sending the Holy Spirit to live in those who love him and obey him was to continue the work that Jesus began while he was on the earth. He was to make his, his people, those that love and obey him, his representatives on the earth to fulfill the purpose that he came for. What is that purpose? Luke chapter 19 verse 10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. Jesus needed people. Jesus needed a body to go and to be in all the world, the presence of love and peace and justice, proclaiming him, Jesus, as the Son of God. And it is the same presence that Moses asked for 1,500 years earlier. The same presence that he said sets us apart from all the nations. The same presence that now dwelt inside of people. People. People like you and people like me. Because it's him using a vessel that says, yes, I love you. Yes, I will obey you. I will walk in your ways. I will follow your leading. I will walk towards the truth. I will surrender myself into your care. The great transfer from darkness to light has taken place. And we have, as the body of Christ, become the very temple of the living God. The very place where he said, I will come and I will make my home with them. I will come and I will reveal, I will show myself to each of them. But we can struggle with that at times in our lives and not draw on the promise and the promises made to us that he will lead us, that he will teach us, that he will reveal himself to us, that he will not leave us alone, that he will not abandon us. Sometimes we forget. We're, we're a little bit like the people from Moses' time. God wants us on the same page, but sometimes we find it difficult or we can't seem to be on that same page all the time. And yet that's where he says we are. Because he says, I am living in you. 
My wife tells me not to take some jobs if I don't know how to do them or if I've never done them before. And she says, so, so what you do is nothing. You don't call the person. You, don't, you, don't, you just do nothing. You just stop. It's true. I'm working with Eddie, helping Eddie in his basement with a, a basement renovation. The whole thing from the walls out. And Eddie calls me boss because I'm helping him, I hope, to understand tools and, and tape measures and saws and knives and squares and, and all the things that go along with, with making your house your home. But I say, really, he's the boss. It's his home, and I'm just doing what he wants. He's smart, and he's learning, and he's not afraid to go ahead and to try the new things. He's not afraid to make mistakes. So he's helping me, and we're helping each other. So here we are, we're, we're framing in the, the heat run. I'm not sure if you know what the heat run looks like, but every house has a heat run if you have a, a forced air furnace. And it's about 28 feet from one end of the room to the other. And it's not just straight down the room, of course. It starts out single, then it goes to double, then it has a little curve in it, then it goes down, and it's got a couple of steps in it. And so one day, we were going to frame around this this heat run so that we could put the drywall on. And so one day, I was at a place at the end of the heat run where I had to make a little step. I had to come to the end and I had to make a little step, about an inch and a half. And I stood there and I looked at it and I wasn't sure what to do. And Eddie wasn't there. I needed his input. I needed to, because he understood this, he could see it, but I couldn't see what, what needed to be done. And I wanted to do what he wanted done, not just my own way. And I got so flustered that I basically just stopped and, and I started saying to myself, why can't I do this over and over? And it was almost like I, I was just being, being attacked. And why can't you do this? Can anybody relate to that? And that's how we get, we get off the page with God. And we do that because we get in a frame of mind at that moment that, that's, that says, I can't do this. And so, yes, instead of saying, Lord, can you help me? My wife always tells me, when I lose something, did you ask God? And, and really, I'm already upset because I can't find it. And so I'm already out of the, I'm already out of the right attitude, the right frame of mind. Did you, did you ask Jesus to help you? And what happens then? We just get all the more upset. When Eddie came home, I brought him down there and... and uh, we looked up, and, and it was just so simple for him. He just said, we're doing this, and we're putting this here and that there. And I couldn't see it on my own. But when he came, I started, I, I could see it, and I started putting the pieces in place, and then I could see how it would work and how it would look when it was finished. I needed his help. And Eddie helped me. The second, the second time at the other end of the basement, I just put it together. I didn't need his help because, because I had learned something. I'd learned something from, from him. And yes, it might, you might say, well, that's, that's it, just in the natural. Yes, it is. And yet God teaches us from the people that have input into our lives. And God is so good, isn't he? I'm supposed, to help, I'm supposed to be helping Eddie learn about building and tools, but he's helping me see, see things I couldn't see. And I see this as God. He's leading. He's teaching. 
and he's revealing himself in my everyday experience. He's helping me through another member of the body. The other day, I was raking leaves, and my father-in-law came by to see us and have a coffee. And, and so I'm raking leaves, and I got a big pile of leaves there. And he came to where I was raking, and he said, Don't you wish the good Lord would just blow all the leaves away and make them disappear? And I turned and I said, Yes, Frank. But God wants to use people. He always uses people. Because that's the kind of God he is. He can do all kinds of things himself. But he wants to use people to do things like raking. To do things like help someone uh, do something on their ceiling. It's one more story before I close this morning. About two weeks ago, I came to a place and and I began to worry about something, and I didn't, I didn't tell my wife, but I began to worry about something. It's the kind of thing that freezes you, gets you again into that, into that frame that you don't want to be in. It's not the, it's not the right frame of mind to where we, we have that right communication with God, and we're, we're frozen, and we're crippled. Worry can cripple us. I couldn't see the way ahead. And we can know all the verses about not worrying, trust God, believe me, have faith. But, but worry can take us away from that. But within the, that very day, within 24 hours, God just answered my worries. So much I just said to myself, wow, my God is good. Sometimes in our personal journey, in our struggles, God just shows up. He just shows up quickly. And he just shows up and reveals himself in fresh ways. It doesn't matter how long we've been in Christ. From the very start, years and years ago, God is still fresh that day and new as he was years ago. And sometimes he uses people and sometimes he comes in our quiet time, in our quiet place. Because he hears our deepest needs and our longings. Why? Because he lives in us. He is fulfilling his promise to us to lead us, to teach us, to reveal himself to each of us who love him and obey him to know his ways and to understand him more completely. Same page. Didn't Paul say, but we have the mind of Christ, that we might know the wonderful things he has prepared for us. Didn't he say, let this same mind be in you, as in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself and made himself of no reputation? Didn't Paul say to learn of Christ and let the spirit who is in you renew your thoughts your attitudes. Together, we are his house, his body, here on earth, to fulfill his plan under his leadership. Let's pray.